Hello class, today marks the 57th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. He was our 35th president and only 46 years old the day he died. He was the youngest elected president at age 43. Only being beat out in that category by Teddy Roosevelt, who was not elected in his own right but rose to the presidential position after the assassination of President McKinley. He was 42. Teddy Roosevelt would go on to win an election in his own right in 1904. You can search for hours, days, probably years on YouTube and the web for JFK documentaries. And you will find lots of conspiracies, lots of conspiracy videos, and, and some even ridiculous notions. But today, I'm going to focus on the official facts and timeline of the day, and the day before it, and a few that follow. Please note that I realize I will be leaving a lot out of this video. I know, but for now, let's just focus on what happened and when. So here we go. Let's start the day before. That would be November 21st, 1963. The president and his wife, Jackie, arrived in San Antonio, Texas on November 21st, 1963 at 1.30 in the afternoon. This is the first major public event that Jackie has taken part in since the death of their third child, Patrick, in August. In San Antonio, the president dedicates the U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine before flying on to Houston. There, he gives a speech to the League of United Latin American Citizens. JFK attends a dinner at the Sam Houston Coliseum. At 11.07, Air Force One lands in Fort Worth, Texas. Just before midnight, Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy arrive at the Texas Hotel. On the morning of November 22nd, Kennedy greets crowds at 8.45 a.m. and then gives an impromptu speech outside the hotel. At 9 a.m., the president participates in the Chamber of Commerce breakfast, and Mrs. Kennedy joins him around 9.20. This is where President Kennedy gives his last public speech. This is also where he is given a pair of cowboy boots. You know that you don't wear a hat. <laughs> Didn't let you leave Fort Worth without providing you with some protection against the rain. At 11:20, the couple boards Air Force One for the quick flight to Dallas. By 11:35, they have arrived at Love Field in Dallas. This is where the Johnsons greet the Kennedys after arriving on Air Force Two. At 11:46, President Kennedy cannot resist the group of people welcoming him. To Dallas, so he approaches the crowd to say hello. At 11.52, the motorcade, including the open-top limousine, leaves Love Field. In the limo with the president is his wife, Jackie, and the Texas governor, John Connolly, and his wife, Nellie. They are headed to a luncheon at the Dallas Trade Mart. At 12.21, the motorcade turns onto Main Street in Dallas. Over 150,000 people have lined the publicized 10-mile motorcade route. The first shots rang out at 12.30 where both President Kennedy and Gov Governor John Connolly were shot. Immediately, the presidential limo races up Stemmons Freeway and heads to the nearest hospital, Parkland Memorial Hospital. The first news story goes out at 12.34. 
two minutes before the president arrives at Parkland. CBS interrupts the soap opera as the world turns to announce the president was shot at 12.40. Police broadcast a description of the suspect for the first time at 12.43. FBI Director Hoover calls the president's brother and Attorney General Robert Kennedy also at 12.45. Due to the president's Catholic faith, Father Oscar Hoover arrives to give last rites to the president at 12.58 p.m. Kennedy's scheduled speech at the Dallas Trademark was scheduled for 1 p.m. that day. That is also the same time that doctors declare President Kennedy dead. At 1.11, officers find shotgun shells on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Officer Tippett is killed several blocks away from the Texas School Book Depository. At 1.22, a rifle is found hidden in the northwest section of the sixth floor of the depository. At 1.30, the acting White House press secretary gives the announcement that the president has died. He died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. First news presses announced the death at 1.32. News wire services announced the death at 1.33. Vice President Johnson arrives back at Love's Field at 1.33 after leaving Parkland Hospital. Governor John Connolly undergoes surgery at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Lee Harvey Oswald is arrested at the Texas Theater after short struggle at 1.50. He will be charged with the murder of Officer Tippett later that evening. He will eventually be charged with the President's murder in the early hours of November 23rd. At 2 p.m., a Parkland Hospital employee finds a pristine bullet on the President's stretcher in the hallway. The Secret Service overpowers local autopsy requirements and moves the President's casket from Parkland Hospital at 2.04 p.m. Mrs. Kennedy accompanies her husband's casket back to Love's Field at 2.08. By 2.15, the casket is on Air Force One. By 2.20, the interrogation of Lee Harvey Oswald has begun at Dallas Police Headquarters. At 2.38, Lyndon B. Johnson is administered the oath of office aboard Air Force One by federal judge Sarah T. Hughes. At 2.48, Air Force One departs Love Field to return to Washington, D.C. The plane lands at 4.58, and the president's autopsy begins at the Bethesda Naval Hospital at 6.35 p.m. The president's casket is escorted to the East Room of the White House at 3.34 a.m. on November 23rd, after the autopsy. A private mass is held for the family at 9 a.m. and President Johnson declares a national day of mourning. On November 23rd, Lee Harvey Oswald is shot by Jack Ruby at 11.21 a.m. He is also taken to Parkland Memorial Hospital where he dies from his wounds at 1.07 p.m. The president lays in state at the rotunda of the Capitol building where he will remain until after the memorial services. Some 250,000 mourners will view the president's casket in the Capitol building. The sound of a muffled drum sweeps in melancholy waves over the hushed throng, a hush broken only by a stifled sob of murmured prayer. A whole people is lifted up out of sorrow. He begins the long hours of Republic grief with the courageous dignity that has marked each moment of her ordeal. Caroline and John seem to mirror their mother's boy. With President Johnson, Robert Kennedy, she is in the van of the mourners who will pay their respect in the historic rotunda of the Capitol. Bearing the burden of their own sorrow, a quarter of a million people brave the increasing weather to pass by the death president. The president's casket leaves the Capitol on November 25th at 9.59 and heads back to the White House, 
where Mrs. Kennedy, family, and more than 100 mourners join the procession to St. Matthew's Cathedral. 1221 is where we have the iconic and heartbreaking image of John Jr. saluting his father's casket. President John F. Kennedy is laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery at 12.30 p.m. At 1.54, there's a flyover and flag ceremony. And at 2.15, the eternal flame is lit by the president's brother Robert and wife Jackie. Officer Tippett is also buried that day with 700 fellow officers attending his funeral. The Harvey Oswald's funeral is also the same day. Reporters were used as pallbearers. So 57 years later, we still remember the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963. Thank you for joining me today. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving.